and these are Yulia Kovanova and Lars Kohns, if I pronounce well. Uh, Yulia is a Scotland-based visual artist and filmmaker. She employs an interdisciplinary approach across a range of media, including uh, sculptural and audiovisual installations and experimental and creative documentary film. Her research and practice currently focus on the investigation of the ecology of color and its dynamics, the ideas of spatio-temporal borders and perceptual boundaries. Yulia's work has been presented at leading art events including Setuchi and Aichi International Triennale in Japan, Edinburgh Art Festival and Edinburgh Science Festival, as well as international film festivals. She taught art, space and nature at Edinburgh College of Art. And her film, Plastic Man, received BAFTA Scotland and UK Best Short Film nominations. In 2016, together with artist and landscape architect Ross McLean, she co-founded the Surface Agency. She delivered artistic commissions for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the National Health Service Lothian and the British Council. And Lars, Lars Kunz is an artist and composer with a PhD in astrophysics. His work explores the importance of art in understanding and shaping the relationships between humans and non-humans. Born in 84 in the Netherlands, he studied at the University of Amsterdam, University Center in Svalbard, University of Bristol, and finally in Edinburgh, where he completed his PhD and a postdoc in cosmology. Since 2014, his films have reached an international audience at major film festivals, such as Edinburgh International Film Festival, Hamptons, Zinebi Full Frame, On Arbor, and Fe uh, Festival de Nouveau Cinema. Since uh, uh, Graminoids in 2014, a short film co-directed with Demel Zakoy, he continues to interrogate cinema's position in an ecological context. His sound and installation art has been featured at Sonica in Glasgow, Edinburgh International Festival, Media Art Biennale in Wroclaw, uh, Fact in Liverpool, MMCA in South Korea, and Aichi Triennale in Japan. In 2017, he started teaching experimental film and sound design at universities in UK, and since uh, 2021, he has been a senior lecturer in filmmaking at Nottingham Trent University. So welcome both, and I pass the screen to you. Good morning. So I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Just a minute. So I hope this is, uh, you can see this okay. Yeah, um, so good morning everyone and happy International Colour Day, uh, which is coming tomorrow I'm from Scotland. So I'm normally based um, in Edinburgh, but today I'm in Perthshire, if anybody's been to Scotland. And maybe in terms of colour, this is one of the most beautiful areas um, in Scotland. So um, yeah, today Lars and I are going to talk about one of our recent art projects called Chroma Calls. Um, so as Maya introduced us, I'm an artist and researcher, and um, at the moment I'm teaching art and design at Edinburgh University. And um, I always often work with their, uh, through a research-based approach um, and across a range of media. And recently, and specifically for this research, I've been working with sculpture and sculptural installation. Um, and this research that deals with the um, ecology of color I started in 2018, 2019, um, and um, I work across uh, at the intersection of three disciplines, um, which is color theory, ecological thinking, and art. Um, and yes, this idea of entanglements that kind of goes through um, my research is largely taken from the field of environmental humanities, um, where I'm interested in the role of human in the wider interspecies relationships. Um, so I suppose I'll just um, go ahead and start um, introducing the Chroma Calls project, and then Lars uh, will come in to talk about different aspects um, of the project. So, um, yeah, uh, some, some images uh, from this project. Um, it's a public sculptural installation of um, about 20 sculptures, which we presented initially in, in summer 2021, so last summer. Um, in Scotland at um, Forth and Clyde Canal. So Forth and Clyde Canal in Scotland is one of the largest waterways. 
um, and the sculptures were positioned at the four mile stretch or um, six, and a, six and a five, I think uh, six, six and a half uh, kilometers, I think. Um, so it's quite a long walk. Um, lots of people sort of go there for a walk or cycle um, and or, you know, they can hire sort of a boat and stay there for a few days. So it's really lovely, uh, lovely place. And um, I'll just show you actually a little bit. I think next one. So um, I've selected quite a lot of sunny pictures. Of course, it's not uh, very true in Scotland. <laughs> um, it's not uh, always like that, but um, it is uh, really beautiful and different times of the year, different colors um, come in. And this section of the canal is in between um, the Falkirk wheel and the Kelpies. So I've got the uh, photographs of the Falkirk wheel here um, and the Kelpies beautiful um, structure. So um, this project, um, let's see, yeah, uh, this project emerged out of this recent research, um, which focuses on the dimensional nature of color, which I examined through sculpture. And I'm interested in the potential of color to constitute special, special relationships and also um, looking at um, how that would engage the viewer. And um, this notion of entanglements uh, largely through ecological inter interpretation um, and working with that, I look to sort of devise um, various artistic or sculptural approaches toward, towards negotiating the space and inside specific terms. And obviously color is one of the key, um, the key element really. And I'm very interested at how color can open up spaces and how it can help us to correspond or interact with uh, the surroundings. So the sculptures um, are based on the colors and color patterns of birds that based um, at the canal. So the canal is really, is very much rich in uh, wildlife um, and also important part of uh, cultural heritage. And the sculptures, they draw attention to the ecology of the canal through the colors of these um, birds. Um, so some examples of the birds are like swallow, oyster catcher, kingfisher, mute swan. Um, and I worked with the canal ecologist uh, to identify, um, to, to select a range of bird species um, and ended up with 20. For me, of course, it was interesting in terms of color and um, so the different color patterns, color, color combinations, just to, um, to, to see a range of different colors. Um, so let's see, I'll just show you how the, this one maybe. So just to show you how each um, sculpture would correspond with the different bird species. So this is an example of Robin. Um, maybe many of you will know this little bird. Um, and so working really with um, very simple shapes, um, circles, lines, and looking at the distribution, sort of the proportion of um, each color within, within the bird plumage um, and constructing these um, abstract sculptures. And each of them is about um, just under a meter long and half a meter wide. Um, and they were positioned uh, on the trees sort of hanging maybe four meters high from the trees. Um, and in terms of selecting the colors, um, a lot of it I tried to do um, through the direct observation as much as possible. Of course, there are some birds like, for example, kingfisher is very, very difficult to spot. Um, so I've, I've not been actually lucky to see, to see one um, at the time of, um, sort of selecting color, but otherwise a lot of them are the kind of birds that also, you know, live in cities or close by. And so you can, you, you can spend some time observing them, looking at the colors and selecting them. And, um, and of course this um, exercise sort of showed how, um, how difficult it is to just uh, narrow down to, you know, to a specific color because it of course constantly changes in different times of the day at different species, even different age of um, species. 
Um, and of course, where they are, are they in the water, are they flying? So um, then it's really, uh, it was interesting to look at the combination and achieve a combination which might uh, give you an entry, a sort of the understanding of what bird species it might be. Um, so I'll just show you another. So this is when uh, we were sort of selecting um, the uh, different, try different combinations, uh, arrangement of the ele elements to, to see which one would maybe be um, more successful. Um, so these are the 20, the final selection of different bird species. You might know some of them, um, but they are quite, a lot of them are quite common uh, in Scotland. So, and then here I've got a few images. So this is our, um, it's, it, we worked with um, a tree house specialist actually to attach the sculptures onto the trees. And that was an interesting exercise because um, when initially thinking about where they can be positioned, I sort of had one um, understanding of where they can be. But then when you work with somebody who has, um, you know, much uh, closer, understanding of trees and what's possible and how, how high this person can climb. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, Patrick uh, Fulton that we worked with, um, I felt that he actually uh, is more comfortable in the trees rather than on the ground. And um, so he allowed us access to tree areas, which actually I don't think would be possible without him. So yes, yeah, so of course this project involved a lot of um work with you know with other people and um and that um enhanced the project immensely um the sculptures are made out of wood um so primarily birch bamboo and also we used uh, eco-friendly paint um and when we were selecting where to position to position the um the sculptures so initially we just started um you know identify the trees we can which we can actually access, then started looking at, you know, the color of the bark, the color of the tree, uh, tree leaves, the foliage, um, and then just thinking how each um, combination of, um, of colors um, would work with, with this or that tree, um, and also, you know, how high uh, or low they were positioned. Um, and initially we were sort of just really thinking about purely aesthetically, but then started noticing that as we were um, hanging the sculptures, that uh, those bird species that we were actually um, working with, they started just appearing in different places. Um, and it was really interesting because then we just thought, oh, why don't we just let the birds um, help us um, in terms of where to uh, place the sculptures? And, uh, and that was really, really wonderful and magical when, when this was happening. Of course, it's, it's a chance, it's sort of random, um, arrangements, but um, I thought, yeah, it was it, it was lovely to do it in that way. Um, what I thought was very interesting is that, obviously, you know, the ecology of the canal, the the, the bird species, or you know, other different species of plants. Um, this area is really rich in color, but at first at first sight, when you when you come in, it looks very much sort of green, a lot of green, and then you know. The, the, the canal itself. Um, so what, what was happening with introducing of these um, sculptures and it's really sort of enlarged um, color combination of those bird species is that, um, you know, they, they were sort of presented there a bit more prominently and um, allowed people to, to sort of notice um, those, those colors a bit more. And, um, and a lot of people actually did manage to uh, understand which bird species they, they corresponded with. Um, and another one is, again, you know, when you are in a natural environment and, and it's this idea of paying attention. And, um, you know, if you really look, you will spot certain bird species. And the same with these sculptures. Um, some of them, for, to find some of them, you sort of really had to be attentive and to look. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's almost sort of exercise in, in attentiveness. Um, and maybe one other point before I pass on to Lars 
is just thinking about the canal itself, which is an interesting combination of nature and culture. Um, it's very rich natural environment, but also um, be, it being a canal, um, it's of course, it's also an industrial sort of space and there are lots of bridges and locks and boats. So um, in addition to approximating the birds sort of body parts and working with minimal shapes of the sculptures, um, these, you know, circles, semicircles and lines, they very much echo the canals, um, industrial and natural features. So thinking about the canal as a line, um, the locks and bridges, also the kind of circles, semicircles and, and the Falkirk wheel itself, of course, there is a, this circular shape. So um, it wasn't the intention, but it was interesting how, how then the um, sculpt, the form of the sculpture started communicating, corresponding with, with, with the environment. So I suppose maybe I'll pass on to Lars, um, just thinking about the simplicity of the shapes and... Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so with um, Julia, I have collaborated as a sound artist for installations as well as a sound designer for films. Uh, so I'll talk uh, a bit about the potential future role of sound uh, in Chroma Course. Uh, because it's been part of the of the installation from the from the very start, um, but yeah, I will I will first, as Julia explained, talk about the uh, the simplicity uh, in chroma calls and how I sort of interpret this a little bit, and we kind of discussed this as well um, uh, just last week. But um, yeah, so um, yeah, basically, I will I will then talk a bit about color and sound in my own practice as well and how we will continue with sounding chromacles, hopefully in the future. And if there's time, I'll give an example of previous work with Yulia, uh, which is Colony uh, and the role of sound in this, uh, because there's an interesting relationship, I think, with the sounding Colony and the sculptures of chromacles, which I will explain. So for, for me, every artwork is a kind of transformation of, of, yeah, of the reality, uh, particularly with site-specific work. Uh, if there wasn't any transformation, the artwork would not be perceivable or noticeable. At the same time, particularly in an ecological kind of context, we try not to create work that completely stands out with something that interacts or is entangled with uh, the site. So I believe the way we make the work interact uh, with the environment in, in the case of chromocores, uh, is by creating little islands within the environment where nature or reality uh, sort of takes a break or a pause from the otherwise complex uh, kind of network of things. Uh, and this simplification is simultaneously also a kind of addition of openness, um, which I will try to explain. So by kind of reducing what we kind of represent the birds to a certain set of fundamentals or essentials, uh, the colored geometric shapes, um, we hope for the imagination of visitors to become part of the installation. And this imagination will, of course, strongly depend on how we choose this set of fundamentals. Uh, and in this case, the choice of simplification uh, enhanced the colors. Uh, for example, we could have decided to focus solely on the shapes of birds instead, uh, throwing out the colors, uh, which would have uh, provided a very different kind of imagination and interaction with the space. So with the colors, the work resonates with the colors of other objects in the environment and perhaps beyond. Uh, and it is in this way that I believe there to be a kind of openness to the work which stems from the reduction uh, in the complexity of our primary kind of inspiration, which are the birds, which are really quite surprisingly complex uh, kind of visually and in shapes as well. So we, while we simplify the birds in the design of our sculptures, we also obscure a direct access to the birds that they represent. Uh, thereby opening up people's imaginations, uh, but also the sort of interaction with the environment. But I think also a kind of playfulness or an exercise, as Julia uh, kind of called it, uh, that establishes this accessibility. And I think this is something that we both do in our, in our work quite a lot, but I think other artists as well, is that you have a sense of play within your own practice that you can communicate uh, to the visitors um, in the work. Uh, so the sound, so this this kind of playfulness is also part of our approach to the sound in chroma calls. So uh, sound was part of the project from the outset. Um, however, there's no electricity along the canal, so speakers were out of the question, and we decided to make the sculptures in such a way that they can work a little bit like wind chimes, uh, possibly stuffing them with various materials to control their sound. And I'll explain a bit how this developed further. 
So the relation between sound and color has a very long history, which I won't go into, but I should note because of the title of the work that the word kind of chromatic uh, is used both for sound and for color. Uh, and this relation derives perhaps from the idea that one can uh, construct all the colors imaginable with a limited set of primary colors in the same sense uh, that all the Western music can be played with chromatic scale on the piano. Although this comparably, uh, I think, yeah, I think this kind of comparison only goes so far. Uh, but there's this same idea of colors as, and sound as being kind of reducible to a certain kind of primary set. Um, so, like many people, I feel a connection between sound and color. Uh, but any kind of synesthesia I have is very vague and probably very much influenced by the cultural meanings of colors and sounds. Uh, I do think of some of my composition and, 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 and work as, as sort of having a very specific color in my brain, uh, like yellow and some, some compositions, they kind of change in color or they have a texture on top, but there's nothing too sort of specific. Uh, and some kind of compositions have a stronger uh, kind of color feel uh, than others. Um, and then there's also, of course, the physical connection between colors and sounds because they're both uh, waves, and as I have a PhD in, 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 in physics, I of course know uh, quite a bit of, uh, of this, but I think, um, you know, because there are, there are different kinds of waves, I think that any kind of physical connection within a work is, is a, can be a bit contrived, uh, unless it sort of comes from the work itself. Uh, and, but, but I usually just go with what feels right um, or if there's any kind of method that comes from the work, then that's great as well. So that's that's what we did in Colony. Um, maybe next slide when I discuss. Yeah, thanks. Um, so basically, uh, what happened is that Julia asked me to make sound for this, um, and um, each sculpture kind of represents an Arctic turn, and their variations were inspired by blurring photographs of the Arctic turns in flight and reducing this to five circles. Is that sort of how it was, Julia? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So the only method or rationale I kind of went with here was to take the basic compositional form that exists in the visuals of five overlapping shapes with multiple iterations and turning those into mini compositions of five overlapping sounds. So that's kind of the method. Uh, and all, uh, but, 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 but they're all different. So I wasn't going from like red is this sound or black is that sound. It's all, it's all different and I've kind of made it bizarre uh, and sort of alien sounding in order for the much uh, longer silences uh, between the mini compositions to allow for a kind of breathing space from the kind of bizarre uh, kind of nature of, of the compositions uh, to sort of empathize um, uh, the sort of you know openness of uh, or, yeah, or the spatiality of the installation. Uh, it was never kind of kind of direct, uh, yeah, it was never a sort of direct translation or, or from, from the sculptures to the sound. Um, but the role of sound played as part of colony is similar to, I think, how chromacles uses colors in the environment to mark visual moments or meeting points between visitors and environment, because the sound in colony are, are so similarly kind of, they're, they're kind of rigid. So they're, they're kind of reduced or abstract compared to the colors um, in, in, in like chromacles. So when, when people out of nowhere suddenly hear these five layered sounds uh, in colony, they, they're called to a halt. And because they know the sound some, somehow belongs to the sculptures, they interact more attentively with the work and the space, I feel. And it's like the work, work is sort of greeting uh, the, the, the visitors and starting a conversation. Uh, at least that's how I sort of like to think about it. So uh, back to chroma course, if there's time. Um, uh, so the sculptures in chroma course are constructed from movable hollow parts and surprisingly noisy when you carry them around in a room. Uh, so this was also, the, the, this was always, uh, I, I, yeah, I think it was kind of funny when, 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 when we were working on them. Uh, but, if you, but if you put them in an, in, in, in an already noisy environment, the sound is too subtle to be noticed. So we never really describe the sculptures as sound sculptures or sound art, although the name of the work uh, still makes reference to sound, of course, with course in chroma course. Um, the noise they make is from the wooden circles, semicircles, bamboo legs and feet clanging together in various ways, depending on the design. And we've recorded this with contact microphones uh, in like a, uh, which was in a studio and the results were encouraging enough for us to explore this further. 
So for our next kind of iteration of this work, we want to make sculptures again, or use the ones from Falkirk and exhibit them um, in a more traditional kind of gallery space. Uh, we will then play the sound of the pre-recording uh, um, yeah, with the microphones uh, from speakers in the space to express their movement without you actually seeing the movement. Uh, so it's a bit like seeing a static motionless wind chime or hearing the sound that they typically make whilst not seeing or feeling any wind. Uh, so the sound points at something much larger uh, and more sort of environmental. So that's sort of the plan uh, and I'm very excited about this. Um, so this will probably be our next exploration with this work, along with all the visual and spatial questions that come with it, of course. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank yeah. you very much. But just to add that in terms of the sort of chroma calls, the name as well, I mean, obviously, you know, everybody can interpret it in different ways. And um, when, you know, for me, when thinking about calls, it's also thinking about the bird call um, mm. and, and just thinking about this idea of communication and thinking about how color is very much, you know, it's um, invitation as well into, into communication. And then, you know, the chroma calls is through color invitations into, you know, this, um, uh, this, this kind of new space. So there are, yeah, a number of um, interpretations to it. And as Isabel was talking about, you know, color as invitation. And um, so this is also, it's um, kind of inviting into, into this, um, you know, kind of discussion and dialogue between the viewers and the sculpture, and then thinking in terms of the sculpture and the surrounding environment. So there is this, um, yeah, communication is, um, is happening. Um, and then just also to add what Lars was talking about um, in terms, you know, rather than doing a direct kind of illustration, illustration or translation, um, when working, say, with color and sound, again, you know, this dialogue is what, to me, makes it really interesting um, rather, than, rather than illustration, because then even a new space is created um, working with like color and sound. Um, so I suppose just one thing to add is that um, the um, kind of the, the artwork within the chroma calls um, can also act as a sort of entryway, um, as a way to tune into the chromatic nature of the environment and as a way um, to entangle through color with this environment. And I suppose in a more general terms, um, this uh, sort of exploration, um, can be applied to a consideration of how we are um, engaging with or relating to or corresponding with and interacting with our environment um, and all the participants, human and non-human, um, and, and ultimately how we place our attention and then how we subsequently act. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs>